I'd like to welcome you to an opportunity to talk with Priscilla Kincaid Smith. Uh, this opportunity has been created by the International Society of Nephrology, who have expressed a wish to create on tape a permanent record of Priscilla and her contributions and achievements to nephrology over the years. Priscilla, a very warm welcome. Thank you. Warm it is too under these lights. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to start by uh, taking you back to your, what you might call, formative years. Uh, you were educated in South Africa, born in South Africa, uh, went through university there, and then after graduating went to London. In South Africa, what do you recall of those years and what did they, how did they influence you in your future career? Well, Tim, I, I have to say initially that I really had no intention uh, when I left school of doing medicine. Uh, it sort of happened. I, uh, I, my major interest in those days was in sport and swimming and hockey, and uh, I, went, I, I wanted to go to university to do a, a physical education course, but indeed I uh, was too young to do that, so <coughs> I ended up um, doing a medical science degree as, an, as a preparation for that, and uh, once I uh, got in touch with medicine, I was hooked on it. And uh, so I then continued. I guess, I mean, I, I really loved uh, growing up in South Africa, and it's still one of my favorite countries, and I'm delighted at the way things seem to be working out there for, for everybody. Uh, I uh, was rather politically involved in those days against the government, and uh, I suppose what, that was one of the highlights of my student career, apart from my, uh, uh, from, you know, my real interest in medicine. Um, I spent two years in Johannesburg before I went to London, working at Baragwanath Hospital, which is the 2,000-bed hospital across the road from Soweto, and of course everybody knows about Soweto these days. And I really loved that, and perhaps it developed some of my enthusiasm for, for treating patients and making them better. It was terribly hard work. We worked seven days a week and four nights a week, but we really felt we were curing people, making them better. We had wards full of treatable conditions like malaria and typhoid and amoeba hepatitis and things and uh, uh, you know we, we worked very hard and very well I think to diagnose them and to treat them and most This was cured. back in the 1950s? That was in the 1950s, yes. Antibiotics just coming? Well we had a few, we had penicillin of course, streptomycin only appeared uh, just, just prior to my time there and tuberculosis was a very important uh, condition. Um, and we saw all sorts of things, I mean, like plague, for example, and lots of smallpox and so on. And I really loved those years. And I think my, my label as a therapeutic enthusiast in nephrology probably dates back to that time. And I've always loved making people better. <laughs> Do you remember when it was first suggested or you first became conscious that you might go to Hammersmith? Um, I went to Hammersmith quite deliberately to do pathology because uh, I'd done a science degree uh, majoring in histology and had an interest in pathology and had really thought of a career in pathology. So I registered for the pathology course at Hammersmith and uh, went there to do pathology. But in fact, after a couple of years in pathology there, which I very much enjoyed, I decided that I really belonged back in the ward. So I went back to medicine and trained uh, not in nephrology because there was no such thing. I trained in cardiology and of course uh, developed a major interest in hypertension and the relationship between the kidney and hypertension. I mean, it sounds a naive question in the nephrology context, but why was there no nephrology in those days? Uh, well, all the, all the kidney, well, the only treatment for kidneys was surgical treatment, and there were urologists, but there really were no nephrologists. I, I had the great opportunity of working with some of, the, some of England's foremost renal pathologists, uh, and uh, particularly uh, Dr. Daniak, who was at Hammersmith Hospital. Uh, I saw in those days uh, Dr. Heptonstall from time to time. He worked at St. Mary's Hospital. And I also worked with Malcolm Milne, who was a joint physician on the unit, who was probably one of England's first nephrologists. But there was no term nephrology, there was no training in nephrology prior to 1960. Just had to stay on that period for a little bit, and, and uh, Austin Doyle talks about the fact that for a time you were a bridge between pathology and medicine. Did you have a dual appointment or...? Yes, I did. I, when I worked in pathology, I liked medicine so much that I, I managed to uh, persuade Professor McMichael that I should go on ward round so that right through my time in pathology there, I regularly went to the wards. And, and as you say, it was a bridge doing the post-mortems, which in those days were attended every day by all the top people like uh, McMichael and Sheila Sherlock and, 
so on, and uh, were really a highlight of, of Hammersmith, which linked very much the patient's history with, uh, with pathology. And uh, I really I did then and still love pathology, but uh, my first love is still treating patients. This morning when I came to your office, there was the microscope and the slides, and obviously you'd been at work still uh, reporting uh, pathology. I mean, if there's one thread, I think, to, to what happened from that point forward, it is this joining together of pathology mm -hmm. and, and uh, bedside medicine. And certainly uh, uh, that's the um, uh, dominant impression that I gained working with you for many years. Um, so that had its origins at that time. Um, Bob Murky was around, was he? Bob Murky came uh, when I went back to the, to the medical side and was working with Professor McMichael uh, as a registrar. Bob Murky came over and taught us to do a renal biopsy and uh, taught me to do a renal biopsy, which of course was an important step in my career. And uh, that was the first time, of course, we were able to look at living pathology. And that's what's been so exciting about nephrology, has been that ability to monitor what's happening on an ongoing basis, uh, sort of living pathology. I think that's made an enormous contribution to nephrology and, uh, of course, has been one of my major interests. And, of course, uh, fate, uh, whatever, had you in the position uh, where you had that interest uh, and then the technique came right at the pivotal time. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, of course, brought that back to Melbourne. It would have been the introduction, I think, of Australia to renal biop to closed renal biopsy. There had been a few done previously. There had been a very small series done at uh, the Walter and Eliza Hall. And unfortunately, they had a very bad record in terms of, of uh, complications. And one of my major difficulties in Melbourne in persuading people uh, that renal biopsies were useful was to overcome that that what was always said about them and uh, I think urologists have never liked renal biopsy much and their story was all well, you know everybody has a renal biopsy has a pint of bleeding so it was really difficult to persuade people in Melbourne that renal biopsy was a useful and could be a perfectly safe technique if it was carefully done. I'd like to trace the origins of, of, of another theme in a sense which is the the interest in, in the vascular part of the kidney. Mm -hmm. um, it's true that you um, worked in cardiology to start with and in fact uh, wrote several papers with uh, Barlow. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell us about that? And, uh... <laughs> yes, well I, I mean I did formal cardiology training and, and my major interest was in, in uh, uh, phonocardiography at that time and John Barlow and I published a number of papers on phonocardiology and cardiography um, and uh, you know worked very much closer together he of course is a South African whom I knew well before I went to London and so has mitral a lesion, career. Mitral lesion somehow got his name not yours. Oh you no know, it, it was certainly his work we, we were interested in it we were recording those uh, prolonged late systolic murmurs which had been called benign by, by Willie Evans before him at that time but he certainly was the one who followed it through and discovered what it was all about. And is it true to say that the first uh, kidney paper, the first paper focusing really on the kidney uh, in which you were involved had to do with um, hypertension and infection? Or was well, it? it was a paper on, on vascular lesions in chronic pyelonephritis, as we then called it, which is as uh, we now call reflux. Who hypothesis. stirred your interest in that? Well, I did that work while I was in pathology at Hammersmith, and I had, uh, I, I, I just became particularly interested in the relationship between hypertension and lesions in the kidney and uh, went through the series, I went, I went in fact through all the kidneys in the 5,000 odd autopsies that had been done at Hammersmith and with particular interest in the hypertensive ones and with particular interest again in malignant hypertension and there was a small group of cases which had had malignant hypertension associated with reflux nephropathy in which I showed a relationship between what I called an ischemic lesion uh, which I thought was due to the vascular lesions and which again I thought might be due to the inflammation of the pyelonephritis. Now exactly what the origin of that is I'm not sure. I am sure there is that association between those lesions and severe hypertension and that was my, my first sort of interest in the kidney, I guess, was through, through malignant hypertension. And of course that work is uh, recognised as being one of the seminal papers in that area and uh, the essential messages, I think, have stood the test of time. It's true, uh, one of um, 
my impressions of you, uh, which is echoed in Stuart Cameron's writings in the Thestrift document, which was in KI a couple of years ago, uh, is, uh, and I want to quote this, um, that you have an uncanny knack of picking out just the question which needed answering and equally an uncanny, an, an uncanny knack in obtaining what in time turned out to be the correct answer, uh, despite a slender database on which often to base that opinion. Now, putting another way around, I think that shows you have always had or tended to have uh, remarkable instincts for uh, honing in on, on the right question and then honing in on the right answer. Is, is that your perception? Would you agree with that observation? Yes, I mean, I think it's, I, I think it's quite fair to say that often the, it was based on relatively little data, but then because, I guess, it, it's difficult to obtain data in patients on biopsies, it, or it was at least in those days, I mean, one of the, one of the areas which I think I po possibly was one of my most important contributions was the work on the involvement of the platelet and coagulation in glomerular and vascular lesions, and particularly, of course, in work that I, we did together at, uh, at uh, the Royal Melbourne Hospital on the progression of lesions in, in transplants and how they develop. Now, it was based on relatively little data. It was based on perhaps 100-odd biopsies in transplant patients, but there was 100 more than anyone else had, because, as you know, in those days, people frowned on doing biopsies in transplants. Uh, and, of course, it was difficult to, to prove that the fact that you saw endothelial damage, then you saw platelet adhesion, then you saw fibrin deposition, then you saw proliferation of myoepithelial cells. It was difficult to prove that that was the way in which the vascular lesions developed, but it was, it was pretty easy on the observations to, to make that assumption. And I always feel a little bit uh, upset that although I, I wrote that in The Lancet in 1967, it's never really acknowledged that, in fact, that progression of things, was, which I suggested at that time might be the way atheroma developed, uh, was recognised outside the, the, the renal literature. But um, it was, yes, there was a small amount of data there. And uh, Ross and Glompsett, of course, in the New England Journal in about 1972, I think, uh, put forward that proposition and discovered the, the platelet factor, which was all important. Of course, it's, it's pertinent, isn't it, to reflect on the, in the enormous change which there has been in, in science, of science of medicine, uh, in your time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's true that the very first uh, ever published randomized controlled trial was in 1952, and uh, you, in the late 50s and 60s, um, would have been in an environment in which uh, and progress was made not by big controlled experiments in, in humans but rather by shrewd observation. Mm -hmm. It was a, really a continuation of, of that tradition. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it is, uh, I think, from my personal point of view, an, an accurate observation and uh, uh, it's one I'd like to leave the audience with, that uh, your, your instincts have served you well and uh, uh, it is, uh, I, I'm not aware of any area in therapy where you have uh, latched onto a path or a, a, a suggested treatment that has in time not proved to have a, a, a genuine basis to it and a, and a success to it, which is remarkable, I think. The um, other thing that Stuart said in that uh, article was that you were a therapeutic optimist and uh, he was particularly impressed with your a propensity for going in a fairly radical sense down a what was called a polypharmacy route, which meant combining various different agents together uh, with different modes of action, all aimed at treating the same disease, uh, an approach which was not widely um, regarded or, or at that time. Uh, do you see it that way? Um, and uh, what were the origins of that therapeutic optimism? Yes, well, I sometimes, as I say, think back to uh, to Baraguanath, and it's it's a sort of therapeutic enthusiasm. I mean, I hate not to be able to treat a patient, and uh, and as you know, although of course dialysis and transplantation are very important treatments, my major emphasis has always been on uh, preventing the need for dialysis and transplantation. So you know, there's nothing I like more still today than to see somebody with, for example, glomerulonephritis to make the diagnosis and to, to give them some effective treatment. It was really my pathology that made me 
think that we should be combining treatments. I mean, it seemed obvious to me that in looking at mesangiocapillary glomerulonephritis, where platelets were clearly involved, and there was a lot of evidence for that, apart from my observational data, where there was clearly an immunological process, where fibrin deposition was also involved, that one should not only be treating the immunological disease with cyclophosphamide, but one should be trying to do something about the platelet deposition and the fibrin. And, uh, and I think as time goes on and we get better platelet drugs, I think that will again come back to be a more important uh, therapeutic methodology. That's jumping ahead a bit. I would like to take you back to London and um, the fact is you met Ken, your husband there, mm -hmm. and um, was it ever considered that you might take him back to South Africa rather than him take you back to <laughs> Melbourne? <laughs> no, those things didn't happen in those days. It wasn't considered, it wasn't even really discussed. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, I was, of course, uh, very happy indeed to come to Australia. How did you view Melbourne, which I guess you'd never been to before you came, uh, from London? Did you? I, I thought a it was a, I thought it was a lovely, warm place with beaches and sunshine, and of course it isn't at all <laughs> cold most of the time. But uh, it's it's been uh, my life in Melbourne's been very happy, apart from the initial period when I found that having been offered a permanent job at Hammersmith just before I left, uh, nobody wanted me. I was unemployable as a married woman, which in those days, if you got married as a woman, you lost your job in any sort of university or public service. Yes. And I just found that, uh, you know, you know, I was virtually unwanted. I, I worked for years, as you know, as an honorary uh, uh, physician at the Queen Victoria Hospital and did uh, uh, some research from there, and as a research assistant in the university, but uh, nobody would really employ me in the ordinary sense as a married woman, particularly as I had young children. I want to come back later and talk about women and, uh, and medicine and your mm -hmm. uh, thoughts about that. Um, but uh, just on that specific issue of breaking into the Melbourne scene, um, what was it, as you look back on it, that eventually allowed you to, to re-enter or to enter Melbourne medicine? What was the pivotal thing? I think the most important thing was that I had continued to work through those years when I had young children. I worked half-time for seven years, but I did continue to do studies. I did a big bacteria control trial and a number of other studies at the Queen Victoria Hospital, and I owe a real debt of, de de of gratitude to the Queen Victoria Hospital for uh, facilitating that work and I think it was the fact that I had a number of good publications from Hammersmith before I came to Australia and that I demonstrated that in spite of being a married woman with young children I could continue to, to, to publish papers in journals like The Lancet and I'm sure that that was why when finally women were liberated in Australia and allowed to work uh, I got a position at the, uh, at the Royal Melbourne Hospital as a first assistant in medicine and uh, as, as was what was then called physician in charge of the department in nephrology and uh, uh, you know I think there was certainly opposition to that at that time from certain people but I think it was my academic record that made it possible. The uh, audience would uh, not uh, necessarily appreciate but uh, may have gleaned that that was the time when you began to have children. You had three or two pregnancies, twins and, uh, and a single one, um, as, but you, I mean I have visions, memory of you in fact biopsying uh, a week or so before you had the twins, so you did work through pregnancy and mm -hmm. returned quite soon after, as you say it was a persistence, uh, with a demonstration which you really were determined to, to continue to contribute that uh, perhaps singled you out from, uh, from the others. Um, that was the time in the early 1960s when biopsy you brought back with you. Uh, you set up your own biopsy service, did you, at Melbourne? Well, I was at the Alfred Hospital initially, yes. and one of the difficulties was to get biopsies processed in the way to which I'd been accustomed with multiple sections and multiple stains, which was not something that was done anywhere in, uh, in Australia at that time. And uh, indeed, I ended up setting it up, setting the technique up within the University Department of Medicine, because I couldn't really get the biopsies processed by pathology departments. And I did the biopsies myself. <coughs> I <coughs> taught a couple of other people to do biopsies, uh, but I used in those days to go to all the hospitals around Melbourne and do a biopsy here and there. Um, and um, uh, then we got them processed within the University Department of Medicine initially at the Alfred and subsequently at the 
Melbourne Hospital, but of course that led to the tradition of, which continued from then until I uh, left the Royal Melbourne Hospital, of doing the biopsy preparation and interpretation within the uh, Department of Nephrology and sort of jointly Department of Medicine, University of Melbourne, which uh, of course has led to comments from various places, but I think there's some truth in the fact that if you really want something done well, you've sometimes got to make sure you do it yourself. And you know, I think we did set a precedent in terms of technology, which was extremely important, doing all those special stains, doing immunofluorescence, doing electron microscopy, which is now routinely, I think, done by everybody. Yes, the, and you still have a biopsy service going in your current uh, situation mm -hmm. in, uh, mm -hmm. in uh, what some might call semi-retirement, but uh, is, is really just a, another phase of your career. Um, they, of course, were times when the contribution from biopsy was just being realised. Uh, the first symposium, as I understand it, pulling together collected renal biopsy experience was in about 1960-61. 61, yes, in the London, Symposium. And um, it, over the next 10 years, I think you would be, it would be fair to say that you contributed greatly to the aggregated knowledge, uh, which led on eventually to uh, a meeting in Melbourne in 1972, focusing on glomerulonephritis. And I'd like to come back to that shortly, but um, they were years when um, therapy was, uh, well, you tell me, it consisted of what? What were the therapeutic options for someone with nephritis and with... In the early 1960s? Mm. Um, nothing very much, really. I mean, nothing... About the only form of nephritis that was being regularly treated was uh, the minimal lesion nephrotic syndrome with prednisone, and that treatment, of course, had been established some probably decade or so before. Um, I became interested in cyclophosphamide, um, having seen some of the benefits in the relapsing group of the minimal lesion nephrotic syndrome, having seen the apparent relative non-toxicity of the drug, and having been impressed with some uncontrolled studies in terms of uh, its uh, leading to disappearance of the clinical manifestations of glomerulonephritis, and, uh, and, and indeed demonstrated on biopsy that the lesions could disappear. And, and I still think that cyclophosphamide is a very important drug in the treatment of glomerulonephritis. And I think it's true that we discovered some of the important uh, side effects of cyclophosphamide. And uh, as you know, my husband Ken Fairley was the one who first documented the uh, sterility problems, yes. both in men and women, from cyclophosphamide. Um, but uh, you know, I think there was people, we were therapeutically destitute, and there was no enthusiasm for therapy. And I. I must say that I still think we're an extraordinarily conservative group as nephrologists in terms of treatment. I think there have been very good studies demonstrating that we can treat things like membranous glomerulonephritis, and yet there's an attitude of pessimism and we really shouldn't treat it because it's such a benign disease anyway, ignoring the enormous benefits in individual patients and indeed in the group as a whole. Perhaps this is a, a reasonable time just to reflect on, on that issue and um, it is, I'm sure, I suspect you'd agree, uh, intensely disappointing uh, in 1994 to look back uh, on the last uh, 30 or 40 years and you were already identifying that you were using steroids and psychophosphamide then and there has not been progress in the choice of agents uh, and in many ways um, the, uh, certainly there's no there's, there's lack of acceptance of therapy in many types of nephritis mm -hmm. despite huge amounts of effort and research and, and your own contributions. Uh, do you feel in that sense disappointed or in, in, uh... Yes, I, I feel very disappointed at the attitude particularly. <clears throat> I mean I'm delighted that uh, Jim Donadio and his colleagues have recently published a control trial demonstrating benefit in IgA glomerulonephritis with fish oil. Now I always expected it to work uh, and I think it works probably mainly through its effect on platelets. Uh, but we did a control trial and didn't demonstrate benefit probably because we didn't have enough patients. But um, if you talk to people generally, they say there's no treatment for mesangelia glomerulonephritis. Now that's absolutely incorrect. There are several studies showing that you can you can get rid of the major risk factors of IgA glomerulonephritis with a variety of drugs. For example, the high red cell count, which we found to be the strongest predictor of progression if it's continuing, 
Uh, you can you can reduce the urinary red cell count with all sorts of things, with steroids, with tetracycline, as we showed in the control trial, with uh, phenytoin, as uh, Guido showed in the control trial, and, and a host of other things. But nonetheless, nephrologists say, and I see it in letters all the time, there's no treatment for this condition. Uh, I guess everybody will now be very enthusiastic about fish oil, which we have for a number of years. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sure that that's one of the treatments, but it's this attitude of nothing can be done. But your optimism is coming across, and I'm, I'm <laughs> pleased to see that, because uh, that is uh, one of your main contributions to my own philosophy, and, uh, and I share that, that uh, fundamental view. On the other hand, we are both now working in an environment where, and uh, in my own ro small role in, in, in drug approvals, uh, one is thrust repeatedly into a situation where you can't market or advertise anything unless you've got uh, large numbers of patients in properly controlled trials and uh, outcome markers identified and the whole mm -hmm. rigmarole gone through. Um, you would agree that the therapies you've mentioned uh, haven't yet survived that rigorous scientific assessment uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, there, that provides a sort of conundrum of sorts, doesn't it? It depends on what you mean by been proven or not proven, you know, there's, there's good scientific data that you can do, reduce the urinary red cell count with those agents. Yes. Out. Now, now what, what you're saying is, but who knows that that does any good? Yeah. And that, that's true, I mean, but it seems reasonable to me that if you know that people with IgA disease who've got a urinary red cell count of 500, 800,000 or a million always progress, and those with 10,000 or 20,000 never progress, seems reasonable that reducing the urinary red cell count must be good. But you'll never prove it in a big control trial unless you do it over 20 years. And nobody lives long enough for that. <laughs> no, well, there we are. That's, uh, that's the paradox. But it is that paradox. difficult. It's, uh, yeah. yes. And I mean, it's, uh, it's not uh, unique, of course, to nephrology. The, yeah. the surrogate markers and the difficulty mm. of long-term trials uh, abound in, in many other conditions. Um, but I'd I'm, like, if I may, just mm. in that context to come back to membranous glomerulonephritis, because yes. that's a common form of glomerulonephritis, where again people are incredibly pessimistic. And as I say, they keep saying you shouldn't treat it because it's benign anyway. But as you know, the Australian control trial proved unequivocally in a paper that finally did get, get published in the Asian Pacific Society of Nephrology report, uh, of a huge trial, of a, of a trial that was a huge effort at least, particularly to our unit who yes. put in most of the patients, uh, showed clear-cut benefit in terms of reduction of, of urine protein, increase in serum albumin and change in creatinine clearance. And yet uh, that trial got buried, uh, it's never quoted, and people almost imply that cyclophosphamide isn't a benefit. Uh, but, but take Ponticelli's work, which has been very well published in the New England Journal of Medicine using Torambucil and methylprednisolone. Excellent data, long-term follow-up, excellent data that the treated group do much better than the, the untreated group on follow-up in terms of mortality and morbidity. But in the, in the same journal, you have a, an editorial saying that, um, really saying one shouldn't treat membranous glomerulonephritis effectively. Uh, I think Ed Lewis uh, was the person who wrote that. But, you know, there's this incredible pessimism in spite of trials that show benefit. Do you want to re reflect at this point about America? Because um, <laughs> you sent me to America for three years with George Schreiner, which was a uh, uh, most constructive and wonderful time for me. Uh, it was only, I think, as that time drew to a close and I uh, came home again. And in fact, I came home to Melbourne to uh, work again with yourself that I uh, realized the uh, huge dominance in the, at that time of the physiologists on the American scene mm -hmm. with micropuncture and uh, tubular function dominating the meetings and the uh, research activity. And um, I came home to find that on this, over in the other world, a whole number of things were just going on which were much more related to the clinical scene. Mm -hmm. Now it's my perception that uh, America is just coming out of that era in the last five or more years. And um, there are now some therapeutic enthusiasts. There are now people focusing on nephritis. Um, do you agree with that observation? And uh, do you feel more optimistic about the American contribution to, to therapy? Yes, I mean, I've always admired their science. And their physiologists were superb scientists. But they did have a grip on, the, on nephrology in, in America that I think 
held back clinical nephrology. They were not interested in clinical nephrology in patients. Their research was unrelated to it and has, has, has been of very little value in terms of treating patients. And I mean, I, I overheard a remark between uh, the president of the International Society of Nephrology and one of America's top physiologists, who was also a physiologist, so after I'd presented a paper on our data in, uh, in transplants and platelets and fibrin and the way the vascular lesions developed, saying all this nonsense about platelets and you know, what's that got to do with, with it's not science. And I mean, that was an attitude. And uh, I think, as you say, they are now focusing much more on clinical things and on the need to, to treat patients. And you know, the fact that dialysis and transplantation aren't as wonderful as we'd like them to be and if we can uh, treat people before they get there that's the way to go. I think they have changed and yes. I think there's, there's much more emphasis now of course on the sorts of things that interest me, things you see looking down a microscope, uh, uh, you know even although it's things like in vitro hybridiz hybridization and immunological things it's, it's observing what's actually happening in the kidney and trying to do something about that. Just Focusing on the, one of these pivotal issues, which is um, the physician's right and ability to try medicines which are not uh, proven and uh, uh, where the uh, particular use is not approved by the authorities. Um, you hold high office in this country at this time and in, in, in several uh, institutions. Um, you have a view about that at this time. Um, are you supportive of what you and I did back in the 60s, which was to use drugs for new purposes? Um, and, and if you are supportive of that, uh, what, what riders would you put on it? Well, we'll never make any advance unless we're prepared to do that. I mean, we'll never get anywhere unless we're prepared to, to bridge that gap between animals and, and man, and somebody's got to do it. I mean, I'm currently very interested in doing a trial in this country on a new drug that's been shown to be effective in animals in polycystic disease, and I'm having difficulty in, you know, getting any enthusiasm from anywhere. I mean, as you know, the regulatory authorities say it's not an approved use. The company says, oh, you know, let's walk, move slowly. I've never really belonged in that category. I think unless, unless those trials are done, and, you know, I mean, I... I'm an absolute supporter of controlled trials, even in spite of their difficulties, but we've got to do them. We've got to be prepared to do them. We, we've got to talk to the patients concerned, explain all the risks, uh, but, uh, you know, we've, we, and I, I certainly will proceed with that study if I can uh, get access to the drug, and I'm sure that 100% of my patients with that condition will participate, and perhaps that reflects my attitude, but uh, they're all very keen to have something done. It's true, I think, in the Australians, the, uh, we still um, have uh, a population who, uh, um, who listen to their physicians and are influenced by them, don't we? And, but uh, still want to know it all. Oh, yes, they much, want to know all the information. Much more demanding. And, uh, and, uh, I think we try very hard to give them the information yeah. and, uh, and to be honest about it, but still, they, I mean... But with that right, you are still very... Absolutely, yeah, um, yeah. absolutely. And I, you know, I'd certainly batter my head up against that government brick wall as hard as I can to try and push it down. <laughs> I want to go briefly to two therapeutic areas in the 60s, fluid management, fluid retention management and hypertension. And uh, just take you back uh, to those times and uh, I'd like you to tell us what uh, options there were and what the practical facts were about those mm -hmm. days. Well obviously both those have been terribly important in, in controlling uh, uh, patients with renal disease, particularly prior to dialysis. Um, let's take the fluid one initially because uh, that's the easiest one to deal with. I mean, the, the drug frusamide, of course, became available at that stage, and I think probably, again, we were one of the first units to recognise that you needed to use really large doses to be effective in patients who had advanced uh, impairment of renal function. Now, as you know, we kept patients alive then who normally would have been on dialysis for years, and we kept them alive off dialysis with the use of the what we used to call the Giovanetti diet, which we modified, and with the use of very large doses of frusamide, which were necessary to control their fluids, because otherwise they would have had to have dialysis just to control Before the Before frusamide, what did you have? Almost nothing. I mean, really, clothazide. Southeast and, tubes? Yes, that's right. Yes, we used to drain the, the fluid off the legs. I mean, we had 
none of the prick di diuretics prior to furosemide were really effective in people with impaired renal no. function. So in terms of the fluid, I think that was a remarkable step forward and, uh, and saved a lot of lives in the days when we had very limited dialysis facilities and people used to have to wait for a place on dialysis. Hypertension, as you know, has always been a major interest of mine and I really do think that even going back to the 50s and certainly in the early 60s, we could treat hypertension if, if we really tried hard enough. I think there were a lot of patients that were not adequately treated, but we had the drugs then that would do the job, provided the patient would tolerate the side effects. And as you know, in the 50s in, in Hammersmith, we did a trial of in malignant hypertension of the old drugs, the hexamethanium bromide and ancelicin, that most people wouldn't have even have heard of. And that showed a dramatic difference in the survival of patients with malignant hypertension. And we should recall that malignant hypertension used to kill in a mean time of in six and eight weeks before treatment. So I've always, having had that previous experience, I've always been uh, terribly convinced that treatment of hypertension is very important. And, and I think we're coming back to that again now in terms of the importance of not just half treating the blood pressure, but really treating it. But I think we had the drugs then, provided we had the uh, you know, the, the, the stamina, as it were, to make sure that the patient took them. Half treatment or partial treatment, though, I remember you saying uh, we used to um, heal or allow uh, malignant hypertension to, to heal. Yeah. That would... Uh... Yes, I mean, I was terribly impressed at Hammersmith that you could... I mean, that, that immediate, that sort of rapid death in weeks you could avoid that altogether by a single night dose of hexamethanium bromide when you knew that the patient's blood pressure was quite uncontrolled during the day, 280, 180, you know, pressures that, again, people never see these days. If they, if they were controlled by that night dose, the lesions would heal and the progression of the renal lesion would stop. And, uh, of course, they, they had all the other things. They were still likely to get strokes and later coronary artery disease and so on, but you could stop the renal lesion with very, uh, with, with that sort of treatment. But nonetheless, I think in the ideal world, when we're not talking of saving them beyond weeks, but beyond years, it's terribly important to be meticulous about blood pressure control. Do you remember cardiac beds in the Royal Melbourne unit? Cardiac beds are one of the first things we uh, struggled to get because they cost some money. Yes, and, uh, indeed. You could have the you legs have down up. Yes, and absolutely. the head up at night yes. and still allow someone to get some treatment. That yeah. was a, a necessary um, position to let the, the yes. ganglion blockers work. Yeah. Yeah. They, um, that uh, would have been in the middle or early 60s. Yes. And, um, yeah. Uh, I guess uh, these days, um, with the range of agents, the, um, uh, the question of control of hypertension seldom arises, That's one way or another. Right. One. You could always, you know, really almost always, but I'd say always treat high blood pressure these days. Yes. I have got a page in my notes which is headed um, chance associations or um, fortuitous events and uh, I, th I thought that you uh, and your interest in pathology uh, being on the scene when renal biopsies came along must be one of those. Another must be the fact that you uh, um, won the battle to get a position at the Department of Medicine at, at Melbourne just at about the same time the transplantation began there. Um, uh, do you want to take us through those early days of transplantation and some of the, the heartache and the drama? <laughs> yes, well, Tim, you and I were very much involved together in those days. <coughs> I think that one of the important things that Australia led the world in, and it's something that is still not liked by, by many surgeons, but I think that although it was obviously terribly important for the surgeon to do a good operation, in renal transplantation. It was also terribly important to have a physician or a nephrologist who had the expertise with the drugs to be looking after those patients after transplantation. And I think that the fact that we published that paper in The Lancet in 1967 with, I think it was 79% yes. two-year graft survival, uh, which many people don't believe, and uh, which you and I know is true, and when the world survival at that time was 30%, I think that was the fact that we were able to control the drug treatment and that they were meticulously looked after, and here I must uh, single out you and Jenny Ehrman as the two people who 
who looked after those patients and made sure that nothing happened to them in terms of infection or hypertension or anything else. And um, I mean, again, it was an area which I I loved therapeutically because it was just so wonderful to have something different from dialysis and something that was so much more available than dialysis. As you know, once we transplanted a patient, we had another spot available in dialysis. And, and I've, transplantation has always been a favorite treatment of mine and I've maintained a long interest in it, but nothing was ex as exciting as those early years of demonstrating that you really could get very good survival in cadaver transplants. And it was messed up for a few years after that by all this nonsense about transfusion. But anyway, I think we've got back to, <laughs> to a situation now. But you see, nowadays, they regard that as a good result with all the new drugs. You and I know that you could achieve it in the old days with the old drugs. And some of those patients are coming up for 30 years. Mm. And of course, the um, transplant proved a very easily biopsyable yes. uh, organ. Um, the, um, your own contributions uh, must um, if, uh, count those in, in, in or they must rank highly amongst your own contributions. The, um, do you want to, do you, do you remember the early appearances, the early um, views of transplant biopsies, the, uh, the appreciation that this was a a condition which might have parallels in, in natural disease? Yes, I mean, I, uh, that, as you know, has been one of my, my major interests over, over many years. I first became intrigued with vascular lesions when I was studying malignant hypertension at Hammersmith in the 50s, and of course the vascular lesions in, in pyelonephritis. Uh, and I, from those days, and from experimental studies which I did, I had this concept of those vascular lesions developing in the way that I think they now develop and I think is now accepted they develop, namely endothelial damage, platelet deposition, uh, fibrin deposition and migration and, uh, and uh, proliferation of my epithelial cells. And of course the human transplant biopsy provided the ideal situation to study that day by day. And as you know we did. Uh, and again not without a lot of criticism and of course you did most of those biopsies I think and even in 1970 which was three years after we'd published the paper in the Lancet uh, I was really severely hauled over the coals for daring to do biopsies and transplants and yet that same very prominent and eminent nephrologist who, who criticized me at that time some years later wrote in the New England Journal how important biopsy was in the management of graft rejection. I, I think, you know, I think it was terribly exciting to be able to, to watch those vascular lesions developing uh, and of course to observe some of the effects of treatment on them and you really could prevent them with heparin. Now, again, nobody believed it and we still don't know why heparin works but it has a multitude of actions and perhaps it's not its anticoagulant action that was important but or it, it might be its action on endothelin or on a number of other things but um, we were also able to show that you know that, that a the lesions occurred as they occurred and that you could prevent them and you know of course everybody said what about a controlled trial well we did one as you know and uh, a, a long and hard effort and published it, it in It wasn't big enough or long enough, I, I often it think. Did, it, it might not have been big enough or long enough, but it did show significant mm -hmm. benefit. It, yes. And it was nonetheless, uh, you know, as you know, it was an ag agony to do over five yes. years. Yes. And uh, nonetheless didn't really influence management, no. which is always disappointing. But there are some of our patients still on Presentin and some even on Warfarin. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I think it was a carefully conducted study and uh, double-blinded and so on, and it came out with a result. The, um, you, 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 hidden, you touched there on physicians' involvement with transplantation as opposed to surgeons, and uh, um, I guess we were working in an environment in Australia where the surgical ethos was uh, very much to be focusing on operating and not necessarily much on post-operative care. That is a little different to the American scene where there's been a tradition for, for surgeons to be more involved. But uh, it's interesting to watch the American scene uh, now, or the pendulum swinging, the transplant physicians associations, I think now outnumbering the transplant surgeons and the, the two bodies still meet together, although apart. Um, and 
uh, they're really evolving, I think, through into a situation like what you described. Mm -hmm. And um, if one puts on a purely physicianly hat, one could say that the improving results in America perhaps uh, <laughs> mirror that change. Um, the, um, you mentioned before criticism in 1970 of a particular uh, therapeutic approach or therapeutic uh, technique. Um, how uh, you, you're a person who's in, in, incurred a, a considerable amount of criticism through the years. Um, how have you handled that, and what is your your advice in retrospect about that? <laughs> it's never bothered me very much. I mean, I I suppose I grew up in a fairly tough school, at least in Melbourne in the early years, and uh, it, uh, criticism hasn't hasn't bothered me too much. I, I have the sort of conviction that I'm right, and uh, that helps. <laughs> What helps if you are right, <laughs> at least most of the time, doesn't it? Um, those years we had together in the 60s and early 70s, we were in fact um, putting together a unit, although I guess at some stages we didn't realise that. Uh, as I remember, the new Royal Melbourne Renal Unit opened in about 1972. Do you want to reflect on those years and the... the um, what you may recall about the, the struggle to establish the unit, uh, which in many ways is uh, um, the evolution of nephrology in a, in a microcosm. Yes, well, I suppose the main opposition to the unit was not that we should have a unit, but that it should be the sort of unit that we wanted and that it became. And there were two or three aspects to that. One was the surgical question and who had, who was really in charge of the transplant patients, and that's a battle that has continued over the years, but I didn't mind whose, whose name was on the bed card, provided we could decide what happened to the patients. Uh, but indeed, there were struggles in relation to that. The pathologists were anxious to get the biopsy material back down to the pathology department, and that, of course, was the one that I would defend with, you know, with my life, because that was the most important thing of all, that we could do a biopsy and within a few hours have the result and make a decision and do something about it and also make sure that the technology was uh, state of the art and, and perfect. So there, was, there were constant attempts to try and take sections out of the unit and uh, the, the one laboratory in fact was, was eventually removed from the unit, the, the tissue typing laboratory was to have been there but we managed to defend having a microbiology laboratory, a renal biopsy uh, processing by, uh, laboratory. But I suppose the thing that I had the major battle about was research. And every time I wrote research into the document planning the unit, it was taken out again. And I had to come back and back and back and write it in. Finally, it did get there, thank goodness. Now, of course, research has to be an integral part of any unit like that. And uh, it had to be formally recognised. But it was the first time in Australia that a hospital unit had been recognised as having research as one of its functions. There was and actually lab space put aside with research on the door. That's right, and, and we, it was acknowledged that we did research, and uh, that I think was the, the biggest battle. And you know, the battles were with various people, but I suppose there was a lot of opposition from administration at that time. But we managed to win through and get what we wanted. How is it just? Um, I'm trying as we talk to. Uh, uh, give you a chance to give messages and advice and uh, that others benefit from your, uh, your, your battles. Um, how did you win those battles? Well, what, what, uh, what techniques did you use and uh, as you look back on it, um, well, why did you win? I think, I think working very hard on paper is important. I, I mean, for example, I managed to sit on committees like the NH and MRC committee on dialysis and transplantation and managed to write the sort of the uh, document as to what a real unit should consist of and of course that helped to be able to quote, quote that document. Um, I think one's just got to keep on at it and not accept defeat. I'm sure that's the way to go and if in the final event if you're not succeeding with a new hospital you sometimes have to go outside it and, and as you know we, we did that and tried to persuade various health ministers of the importance of this and uh, I, I think it's just a matter of battling away and, and being sure that that what you're doing is, is the right way to go and, and try and persuade other people to that point of view. Above all, not taking no for an answer. <laughs> we haven't uh, touched much on infection. Infection, you mentioned uh, as an early uh, interest, um, and then you continue that at Queen Victoria Hospital with the drug trials. 
and you ran, in fact, a, um, a urinary infection clinic mm -hmm. devoted to that for many years. Um, that, in a way, did it not culminate in a meeting in 1970, which was the first of what you might call the Melbourne meetings. Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell us about that? Yes, well, I think, I mean, I, I have had, as you know, had a big interest in infection, and this is something in which uh, Ken and I have worked jointly over a number of years, and in which many of the major contributions have been his and not mine. Um, I think at that time, it was an interesting and exciting time. Again, uh, some of my very good friends around the world, John Hodson, who's unfortunately since died, Tom Stamey, whom I saw just last week in, uh, at Stanford, um, were other people who were involved in our interest in those areas. And, of course, the big question at that time was, I mean, there, there was a school of thought that said pyelonephritis or brackets infection causes renal failure. Now, I was pretty convinced from our bacteria studies that that wasn't so, uh, that, it, you know, that you, we, we had a very large number of women in those studies and we followed them through meticulously over the years and half of them were treated, half of them were untreated. And of course, I'm pretty sure the, the, the renal failure that was attributed to infection in the end turned out to be analgesic nephropathy in other countries as well as here. Um, and we were very interested, as you know, in the localization infection and in bladder, infe bladder infection and kidney infection. And, um, and I think, the, I think some, one of the major achievements of that 1970 meeting was to try and separate out infection and what it did or didn't do from reflux nephropathy and what that did or didn't contribute to scarring, and again, uh, renal papillary necrosis or analgesic nephropathy, which of course in this country at that time was a very important cause of end-stage renal failure. And I think it was a landmark meeting. The, uh, the meeting, I think the book was called uh, Renal Infection and Renal Scarring, and that was what it was all about. Interestingly, we've quite recently done a, a trial in acute pyelonephritis looking at what happens with acute pyelonephritis with neuroimaging techniques and have demonstrated that if you take just random patients presenting to the casualty department with acute pyelonephritis, most of whom of course are healthy young women, and you treat them in a standard way as soon as you see them with um, various drugs but sort of state-of-the-art treatment, uh, that uh, over 50 percent of them develop parenchymal lesions, which you can demonstrate on imaging in the acute phase, and 70% of those who have the lesions in the acute phase develop scarring in the chronic phase. Now that was a concept that was quite foreign to me and that we hadn't really accepted previously. We'd thought only reflux nephropathy causes scarring. I think the thing is that the newer imaging techniques are demonstrating this. We shouldn't ignore it. It doesn't produce radiographic damage. We followed our women after pyelonephritis pregnancy for seven years at the Queen Victoria Hospital. doesn't produce change on the IVP, but it does on DMSA scans and on CAT scans. So, you know, I think we almost need to revisit acute pyelonephritis and take it more seriously, take back to your own pregnancy more seriously. Um, so it's, you know, it's an interest I've come back to, and perhaps some of our conclusions from that 1970 meeting in that regard were not correct. The other impression I had coming back uh, to Melbourne just after that meeting was that it set the concept of reflux as a, contrib as a contributing factor to scarring on its feet as well. Up mm. to that point, the Americans particularly were slow to accept mm. uh, reflux as a, as a common denominator of, the, yeah. uh, of that pattern of scarring. And there, of course, Hodgson was... Uh, yes, and indeed it was at that <coughs> meeting that he first uh, spoke of his concept of intrarenal reflux, yes. which is, of course, the important thing that happens to determine the site of the scars and the, and the final scar. And yes, so that was a, a major contribution and you're absolutely right that that was the first publication that mentioned intrarenal reflux. Well, so I think we may just take a short break uh, yes, sure. at this point and, uh, and then when we come back I'd like to uh, talk about a continuing, the continuing time at Melbourne but to in part focus on the analgesic story and uh, uh, more about nephritis and the two Melbourne meetings and uh, other aspects. Thanks. Uh, I was doing like How a
he's uh, turned out to be a terrific fellow, really nice mm -hmm. guy, and uh, um, seems happy enough, but uh, um, not doing anything which you'd call constructive. Mm -hmm. I'd like to pick up the uh, story, if we could, uh, with analgesic nephropathy. What an extraordinary episode that has been for Australia. Yes. If I was to tell you that the incidence of renal failure uh, in 1993, uh, contributing to dialysis caused by analgesic nephropathy, was down to 7%, that would bring joy to your heart. Yes, indeed. And I think that those 7% might have been misdiagnosed. <laughs> <laughs> As you know, at the Melbourne, we haven't seen it for years. We, we stopped probably 10 years ago teaching the students about it because yes. it, for practical purposes, we, we didn't have the patience to show them. Do you remember when you first became aware of it? Yeah. And um, would you like to get a pen picture of what it was all about? Yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a very, very interesting to me, of course. I. I first saw the lesion within days of, of coming to Australia. Um, <clears throat> I, I came here <coughs> right at the end of 1958 and started working at the Baker Institute uh, as a research uh, fellow at, at the beginning of 1959. Uh, and indeed it was in January 1959, which was a particularly hot summer, I recall. And just in the pattern of what I'd done at Hammersmith, I went every day to the autopsy room. And there was this extraordinary lesion on the autopsy table every day. I mean, perhaps they were dying fast because of the, the hot weather or something, but every day there were two or three of these kidneys on the autopsy table that I hadn't seen in six years in London. And when I said to the pathologists, you know, what's this extraordinary form of papillary necrosis. I've never seen it before. They said, oh, that's a very common result of infection. We see it very commonly. I said, well, it's very strange. I never saw it in, in six years in London looking at autopsies every day. And I found it difficult right at the start to accept that it could possibly be the result of infection. So I became interested in it, you know, almost you know, very soon after I landed in Australia. It took some time to uh, establish the association with analgesics. And um, all I was aware of then was that there were these kidneys with pigmented necrotic papillae. Uh, I tried to look at the histories a bit, but there didn't seem to be anything in them. And of course, nobody ever asked questions about whether they took analgesics at that stage. But in fact, the connection with analgesics came through Ken and his uh, experience with uh, private patients whom he was asked to see, uh, patients who went into renal failure after gastrectomy. <coughs> And he was working, <clears throat> as you may know, at that time with Bill King yes. uh, on Bill King's unit. And Bill King uh, was seeing these people who were having gastrectomies for peptic ulceration and who were going into renal failure. And uh, Ken saw them, and, uh, and uh, it was an extraordinarily recoverable form of renal failure often. And we did a few biopsies, and they showed interstitial changes in the cortex. Uh, but nothing very much, surprisingly little for the degree of impairment. But he, of course, in his very meticulous way, uh, took a very good history, established that these people got episodes of renal colic, uh, got, and of course, peptic ulceration was what led to the whole thing, and also discovered that they were taking vast quantities of analgesics. And he really uh, should get the credit for recognizing that it was indeed analgesic nephropathy. Now, it had, of course, been described in Europe at that time as chronic interstitial nephritis in Sweden. And one of the difficulties was making the connection between this cause of papillary necrosis that was so common in Australia, which was obviously associated with chronic ingestion of large quantities of APC tablets, aspirin, panacin, and caffeine, as they then were, and the disease seen in Switzerland, which was largely associated with phenazone and phenacid mixtures, which they called chronic interstitial nephritis. I wrote to them, of course, straight away to Spruler and Zollinger and said, uh, did they see papillary necrosis? And they said no. In their paper, they said in very small print number, they said that nine of the cases, I think, had papillary necrosis, which they regarded as secondary. 
And um, <clears throat> we, you know, it was really establishing that link that was one of the important things, I think. Looking at the kidneys here, and I had a vast number of autopsy kidneys, we collected over 100 between 1959 and, uh, and the, about 1961. Um, it was perfectly clear to me that the primary event was the papillary necrosis. The kidney at the time that the papillary necrosis first occurred was relatively normal. And that where the, where the papillae were lost, you then subsequently got atrophy in those areas and hypertrophy in the intervening areas, which were largely the, the Burton's columns. Um, and uh, I presented this, you may recall, because I think, were you at Prague in 1963? No, I wasn't, no. Well, I presented okay. it at Prague in 1963, and I was absolutely howled down by the European pathologist who said it was a lot of rubbish, it was nothing to do with analgesics, this was obviously infection causing a papillary necrosis, and yes, some of these people might also have this chronic interstitial nephritis from finastin. So it was really overcoming that attitude that was important, but nonetheless, I was convinced then, and I'm convinced now, that the sequence of events was papillary necrosis and subsequent uh, interstitial uh, fibrosis in the cortex and atrophy, uh, ending up with chronic interstitial nephritis. The disease in Switzerland is rather different. Instead of getting these great big black papillae that we see, necrotic papillae, they got tiny little nibbling at the papilla, and that presumably reflects the difference between phenazone and, and the, piece, uh, the APC mixtures here. Um, but uh, it, it, you know, it was a fascinating story to put together, and I think we did put it together first. We weren't the first publication. Publications were always a problem in those days because uh, you know one had to be looking after three young children and trying to write. Papers. And of course, you identified not just nephropathy but the syndrome, yes. which uh, involved, I guess, most other mm. organ systems. What I'd like to hear about then is um, the campaign to get these combination analgesics off the market and mm. perhaps some further observation about the, uh, the use of the word analgesic versus phenacetin. Mm. Yes, well I, I was pretty convinced in the early days that phenacetin was the major culprit. Uh, I presented some of, our, some of our work at a meeting in Boston in 1964 and that was the first time that the doubt was raised in my mind as to whether phenastin was the major or at least the only culprit. And um, I, I have no doubt now that it is a combined analgesic lesion uh, where the aspirin and the phenastin are both important. And indeed, of course, when phenastin was replaced, as it was as early as 1962 in many of the mixtures by paracetamol, it didn't alter the picture at all. It continued unabated and really unchanged. And I, as you may know, we sub subsequently did some work on caffeine and found that that potentiated the effect of non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs on papillary necrosis. And I think that probably all three were contributing. <clears throat> and it was really getting that message across and, and you know, being joined very much by the Kidney Foundation and the Nephrology Society in a campaign to have not control of phenastin, which had already virtually occurred. There was, by 1975, there was no phenastin available in Australia, <coughs> but the disease continued. And in the late 1970s, as a result of campaigns by many people, and I think John Stewart was one of the prime movers in that, and the Kidney Foundation, and the Nephrology Society, and the NHMRC, we managed to persuade government that there should be regulations. And between 78 and about 80, I think all the states legislated not to stop the sale of any of the ingredients, but to stop their combination. And I think, as you say, that's led to the disappearance. I, I haven't seen a new case for years and years. They, they disappeared from Victoria. And as you say, the registry is now showing very little of it. We see the odd one still coming uh, in the 60s and 70s out of Broken Hill or mm -hmm. Port Augusta or somewhere in the north. Uh, mostly they've stopped abusing, but mm -hmm. we're seeing a very late expression, I think, of damage from mm -hmm. those days. But um, this, uh, surely in, a, um, in your career and in a public health sense, must represent a, a real triumph. I mean, this is a... Yes, I think in a public health sense it was, it was very important. More intriguing to me, of course, was the putting the whole story together yes. and the pathology and, and the... And the beautiful clinical. demonstration of the anatomy of the kidney that came mm -hmm. out of understanding mm -hmm. the, the blood supply and the, the why the, the, the bumpy appearance uh, yeah. involved. I mean, any student of the kidney should go back and, and uh, read that and try and understand the uh, evolution of uh, papillary necrosis, I think, is a, mm -hmm. uh, a, a very important message there. 
but it remains, I think, in public health, one of the few areas where a piece of paper has virtually taken away a disease from the community in, in, in the last 20 years or so. And I'd like to quote it to the politicians in that <laughs> regard. Yes, I think, I mean, there really was an extraordinary cult, wasn't there, in Australia at that time? I, I, I mean, I was aware of people wheeling their supermarket trolleys out with two big packets containing a gross of Bex or Vincent's powders. Mm. And that was not, not an occasional trolley, that was most of the trolleys. And so yeah. there was this extraordinary habit in the Australian community, and yeah. I, I never but understood that quite. No, and it wasn't present uh, in uh, England, I don't think, and it certainly wasn't in America mm. when I went there and mm. looked hard for it. It wasn't mm. there, and it did seem to be, uh, in large part, uh, an Australian uh, ethos. Uh, I'd like to turn to nephritis again, and um, uh, focus on the 1972 meeting. That came 12 years after the CBA symposium on renal biopsy. Uh, it uh, was by invitation, largely. Um, I don't know how, I never did know how, but you raised a large amount of money to fly in 20 or 30 uh, hand-picked people who contributed to nephritis. And we sat in the Royal Melbourne Lecture Theatre for four or five days and, to me, um, created history. Was it, did it seem like, like that to you? And well, I'm glad to hear that, Tim. I mean, I, I loved the meeting and I thought it was made very important contributions. I think it was really the first time that people internationally started to focus on the importance of differentiating the different types of glomerulonephritis, characterising them, and set, if you're going to set up clinical trials, doing it on the basis of the histology. I think Rena Habib was perhaps the person who to me has always been an outstanding person in that, that field, and you'll recall her outstanding contributions at the meeting, and uh, she of course has remained a, a very good friend. But yes, I think it was was an important meeting. And um, I'm glad you mentioned Renee because I was going to bring her up later. Uh, it seemed to me, uh, as the one who in those days tended to stay home and keep the fires burning while uh, you did an occasional international <laughs> trip, that whenever you touched base with Renee, you came back with either a recharge or a, a new idea. Mm. And she was, it seemed to me, a import, very important person to you and your thinking at those times. Very important. I mean, Rena Habib is, you know, is I think the world's best renal pathologist. I, I have really always had the greatest respect for her. I've, we, we've always got on terribly well. Uh, we were both born in Africa. She was, yes. she was born in Morocco and I was born in South Africa. And, uh, you know, it, it's been a very interesting association, but she's a very great friend of mine and a, an enormous contributor in the field. And as you say, I mean, every time I had a chance to spend a day or so with her in Paris, and as you know, I never went away for long. I might have gone away often, but I never went away for long. But uh, it, it, we just seemed to somehow find something that each of us gained from those discussions. Uh, I think she's a superb pathologist and, uh, and made and a of course, huge And of course, in those days, Paris, uh, from my perspective anyway, was several years in front of the rest of the world, and uh, certainly in pathology terms, if not in other ways. I would certainly agree with that, yes. And, and transplantation, of course, too, yes. as well before. And, and you, I know, sent several of your fellows over to Paris uh, to uh, take advantage of that. Um, that's changed a bit, do you think? Yes, I think it probably has. Perhaps it's just that I don't know the new people yeah. as well. But I think uh, I don't think people focus on Paris now as the uh, as a sort of centre of pathology. And uh, I think it has perhaps slipped uh, slipped behind a bit. In in part, I guess that's uh, had an up and down with uh, Renee's own contributions. Mm. The Melbourne meeting then pulled together nephritis and sorted sorted it out and. Uh, you know, a way and a, a grouping of conditions uh, that really stands, has, has stood the test of time to today. But it also, Stuart Cameron reminded me in reading about that, um, introduced the concept of life table analysis to areas outside transplantation. And um, that in its own way, I think, uh, is, uh, um, is a real contribution. The mm -hmm. uh, fact that we could look at diseases and their evolution in a, a much more sensible way. Mm -hmm. And um, the uh, same um, uh, attempt to get to pull people together occurred in 1978, another Melbourne meeting in, on nephritis. Mm -hmm. That one, your memory of that? You... Um, yes, I mean, I, I think that the emphasis changed by then. The emphasis was immunological. And of course, some of the main contributors at that meeting, people like Keith Peters, uh, 
and, and many others were much more interested in the immunological side of, of real disease and, and I think that has come to the fore and is in fact uh, the growth area and the important area present. We were looking just at morphology and, and they were looking at uh, more mechanisms, immunological mechanisms anyway. We were looking of course at, at other mechanisms but uh, I, th I think of that second meeting mainly as one that uh, where, immunolo where immunology was the major contributor and it was right at the beginning of that era I think of, of the growth of immunology and coming back of morphology at, at an immunological level into the, into the nephrological. Of course in those level. days I guess we both had high hopes that uh, we would in the next decade find the key and be able to turn that key to to cure more, more nephritis mm -hmm. than we've been able. Let us um, turn perhaps to more general issues. Uh, it's my perception that whenever you have joined an organization uh, or made a commitment to it, like the College of Physicians or the AMA or the Society of Nephrology or others, that you have had a very rapid passage to the top. Uh, usually to the leadership position. I think in each of those that I've mentioned that's occurred. Um, I'd like to hear your account of that and um, perhaps uh, words of advice to those others who join organisations as to why that's happened and how to, to accomplish it. Yes, it's interesting. I mean, it's occurred for a number of reasons, I guess. It certainly wasn't rapid in the College of Physicians. I was on council for 12 years before I became president and uh, it was a closely contested battle. And, um, I, and you know, as you, as you probably know, 12 years is the maximum time you mm -hmm. sit on the council of the College of Physicians, so it wasn't always rapid. Uh, I guess in the AMA, I, I did li deliberately joined the AMA because I believe that doctors need to be involved with government in trying to preserve the best in medicine uh, and uh, not, there's not much one can do in an organisation like that without getting into an executive position and, uh, and so I stood for election to the executive and subsequently chairmanship of council. I, I didn't really intend to get involved in the World Medical Association which I did recently. I, I really did that because I was a little bit put off at a meeting where they um, they wouldn't let me speak because they assumed that I couldn't possibly be a councillor because I was a woman. So I thought there was only one thing to do and that was stand for the top job. But uh, now that I am am president of the World Medical Association, I certainly intend to try and do something from that position in the short period of a year that, I, that I'll be there. Um, I guess it's, it's sort of commitment that uh, enables one to go to the top. I mean, not everybody seeks to go to, to, go to those positions. It, it's work and it... Um, some people are quite happy to sit around the table and, and discuss, but I've always enjoyed trying to make changes. And um, I think I'm supposed to be a figurehead in the World Medical Association, but I don't... Uh, Tend to be that. <laughs> <laughs> what... Um, I would not regard you as a feminist. Would you regard yourself as a feminist? Not really, unless, unless, you, unless you define feminist as someone who thinks that women should have equal opportunities in all things to men. Yes. <laughs> now, if that's a feminist, I'm a feminist. But I'm not, I've never been part of the sort of the, the, the bra burning brigade. I certainly am not on the extreme feminist group that, that uh, for example, say that you shouldn't use certain contraceptives in women because they might be harmful. I mean, that's uh, doing more harm than good at adopting that attitude. Uh, I, you know, I just expect women to be given an equal go. I, I certainly think that women are quite different from men and I can see many reasons by why women A may not wish to succeed or to go to the top in certain areas because of their commitment to their families and that's a very strong uh, fact for women and I think you know when people ask me what I think is my greatest achievement is I, I say and I really believe it that our family stayed together and is a happy family with three successful happily married children and uh, and that's what life's about, for women anyway. But, um, you know, I, I don't know, I don't regard myself as a feminist, but I, I do think that women should have equal rights. I just want to rights. touch on that and uh, seek you, I mean, uh, would you reflect back on your femininity, your, the fact that you are a woman, in regard to your career? Um, has it been an advantage or a disadvantage or at times both? 
I think it's been an advantage in certain situations. I mean, I think it was a distinct disadvantage when I first came to Melbourne and where everybody, but everybody except Ken, expected me to give up medicine and look after my children. Well, I tried to look after my children, but I certainly didn't want to give up medicine. And I think it was a distinct disadvantage then. There was clear opposition to my getting hospital appointments, uh, university appointments. Uh, even at the time that I got my personal chair, there was clear opposition to that, I think, on the basis of gender. And so I think it has been a disadvantage. I think there have been occasions when it's been an advantage. Uh, I'd like to think of it as something that is not particularly relevant, that you know, it's, it's how, how well you can do a job that should, should enable you to, to achieve. You, uh, I can't and won't attempt to rattle off all the firsts, uh, but you undoubtedly um, have been the first woman uh, this or that in about uh, 25 different ways. In particular, I think I'm right in saying the first woman professor of the University of Melbourne, an institution going 150 odd years, um, certainly the first woman president of the College of Physicians of Australia, first woman president of the World Medical Association. First woman on council, I Right, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, I think that's the context in which I wanted to hear you uh, give an account of, uh, of, of whether being a woman had, had mattered. I, I Can I just, <clears throat> just say one word there, because poor old South Africa gets such a rough time from many people that and of course, you know, is my the country I grew up in and the country I love. And I really came out of South Africa without any sense at all of the fact that being a woman was a disadvantage, whereas it clearly was at that time in England, and much more clearly so in Australia. So I think at least South Africa got that right <laughs> in those days. A third of my class graduating in medicine were women. At that stage, and everywhere else in the world, it was 10% or less. So for some reason or other, South Africa gave women a good go, I think. Mm, and, it's an uh, interesting reflection. I, you know, I think that I, uh, I never expected, I mean, I expected automatically when I got the top marks in medicine in, in Johannesburg to get the jobs I wanted. I would never have done that in Melbourne University just because I got the top marks. I wouldn't have been given the jobs I wanted in the Mel Royal Melbourne Hospital. And I think that sort of typifies the attitudes at that time. And I, you know, I, I think that 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 perhaps was one reason why I was not uh, frightened off. <laughs> yes. Can we, you mentioned your um, proud, proudest achievement or the one of which you, uh, your, your, your best achievement it, uh, was your, that of your family. If you put your family achievement to the side, which, uh, within the medical context, uh, what achievement do you look back on with most pride and most joy? I don't have any, any single one, I don't think. In terms of, of you know, my observational pathology, I think in the long term, the, the, the observation of, of the vascular lesion and its, and its evolution in terms of platelets and endothelial cells and proliferation and so on, which leads, of course, to the common lesion of atheroma, but also uh, I described it in the context of graft rejection. I think that's probably one of the most important ones, but I, I don't... Uh, I don't look on any with, with any, you know, saying that uh, th that was my proudest moment in relation no. to medicine. What about disappointments? Do you have any, look back on any particular medical disappointments? I suppose I was really disappointed when I came to Australia and found that I wasn't wanted. I didn't really believe it at first. I hadn't had that idea, I hadn't had the concept, and Ken really hadn't himself thought that that was likely to happen. I, I, he obviously was unaware of the, the attitude about women in Australia. I suppose they were my, that was my major disappointment, was coming here and finding that I felt I had something to offer and nobody seemed to want it, and indeed everybody seemed to think I should give up medicine. Um, I, I, I really was bitterly disappointed uh, to find when I was compulsory retired from the University in the Royal Melbourne Hospital at the age of 65, that suddenly I had a sort of a vacuum for some time and that, um, I mean, I was, I was really felt I was in my full stride. I think I had a most successful final year in, in my uh, department and with more PhD students, more papers, more, more everything really than I'd had in any other year and then suddenly it all came to an end and I think, I think that was a disappointing time for me and uh, I've managed to build up other other areas and other interests, but um, uh, I think I, I think I was 
disappointed at that time. Um, I don't, I mean, I, I, uh, I can't remember any other particular disappointment. <laughs> you must, did you know how many fellows uh, or students you had through? No, I've really never students? kept count, I'm afraid. We really should have done that better than we did. But as you know, we, we always worked with very little infrastructure. <laughs> yes, indeed. It, used to, it must number a hundred. Yes, I'm sure. Um, like and they would, of course, come from many parts of the world. All over the world. Yeah. Um, uh, do they keep in touch with you at this time, or? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I see them from time to time. If I visit, if I happen to visit that particular country, I would usually see the fellows from that country, and uh, uh, that's the time I particularly keep in touch. Every so often, I see a patient comes to Melbourne to see me from somewhere around the Southeast Asian area, and those are almost all from fellows. Uh, and indeed, of course, when I go to other countries, I also keep in touch with them. But uh, it's been a great joy. I mean, one of the one of the worst things about retiring is loss of contact with students and fellows and residents and registrars and you know people where one feels one's contributing to their to their development. Yes. And uh, that's that's a sad part of retirement. Whilst well, just before I ask you about the future, because I'd like to. Uh, uh, get you to gaze into the crystal ball uh, in, in nephrological terms. Um, I would just uh, like to go back to, uh, as a personal contribution and say that the um, um, lingering impression that I have of you is that persistence, is that therapeutic optimism, is that ability to say, yes, let's try it, never, no, let's not try it. Um, and uh, above all, the fact that you uh, had a, uh, that uncanny knack of being right. And uh, I think with uh, those excellent bedside instincts, um, uh, combined with that uh, uh, knack of being right, the, um, uh, the, um, one, one reinforced the message that it was uh, appropriate to try new, new therapies and to, to try new things. But what about the future? The, um, uh, as you look back from 1994 to 1960, or thereabouts, enormous things have happened. Nephrology has been born and is now reasonably mature, perhaps completing its teenage days. Um, various diseases have been identified, and uh, some have come and gone. Uh, you've been right in the middle of most of all that. Where do you see it going? What does the next decade have? What about molecular biology and its contribution to, to therapy? Yes, difficult questions, Tim. Um, I suppose, as you said earlier, it's disappointing to think that dialysis and transplantation have changed so little in that time. One had thought that dialysis would become a you know, at least a suitcase kidney, but something that could be easily transported around and not the, the process it still is as it was when, when you and I first did it in the early 1960s. Uh, and transplantation again has, dis has, has, has progressed, uh, in, has, the progress has been disappointing. I mean, there's always this or that newer drug, but as we said before, they're not that much better than they were 30 years ago. So, I mean, I think that I would hope that in terms of clinical nephrology, the future must be early diagnosis and treatment, and uh, surely there must be, out of all the huge science that's going on at present, to identify the, the underlying mechanisms of disease and all the cytokines and things. Surely there must be some, some new treatments that must come out of that. But in order to, to apply those treatments, the clinicians have got to be bold. They've got to be prepared to make diagnoses. I mean, people are so conservative about doing renal biopsies. They say they don't biopsy microscopic hematuria alone. Well, why not? We've shown quite clearly there are two major diagnoses. One is thin basement membrane disease, where you can send the patient away and say, don't worry, nothing's going to happen to you. The other one is mesangial IgA glomerulonephritis, where if that red cell count remains high, as we've discussed before, they're going to progress and they certainly need to be followed if not treated. So of course you should do biopsies to diagnose the underlying renal disease and it's only by, by being clinically bold uh, and 
and then applying treatments as they become available that we're going to make progress. And as I say, I think that's been disappointing and I think the, the pessimism is disappointing. We've got to grasp onto any new treatments and try them and, and be prepared to wear the consequences if there are consequences. Uh, but, but I'm sure there must be new treatments becoming available out of molecular biology, out of all our huge increase in understanding uh, of, the, of the mechanisms going on in, in glomerular damage, and it's largely glomerular damage we're talking about, glomerular and vascular, uh, even although the interstitium plays, a, plays an important part, it's the same sort of mechanism there. And if you can shut off the proteinuria, you can usually shut off the interstitial component. But, you know, I think, I, I, I hope that clinicians will, you know, continue to try treatments as they become available, and I hope that we'll get on to some uh, much more effective treatments than those we use at present. But, yes, I do see, I do see new things coming along, even though we've had a rather slow, slow progress in the last, in the 30 years that nephrology's existed for, 35 perhaps. Well, Priscilla, I think that may be an appropriate time to conclude, and I'd mm. like to, in doing so, thank you very much for your time and for what I hope has been a, uh, uh, an interesting account of uh, the exciting years uh, during which nephrology grew up. Thank you very thank you. much. Anything else that you wanted to say? No, that, no. Um, no that's fine. Uh, I think we've covered most. I was very happy not to have to really think about it beforehand because it's much easier yes. to do it spontaneously. It isn't it? Yeah. No, I just made a few notes and just the only one I found difficult to answer was the future. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right, and uh, who knows? It's um, um, the um, uh, it'll be interesting to think what to see what people make of uh, of that.